when I mentioned the Arcane Society novels by Jane and Prince and Amanda Quick and Jane Castle, not completely a rhetorical question because I 100% remember mentioning them, but kind of forget in what context or in what video. However, if you did enjoy the Arcane Society novels, particularly the Amanda Quick Arcane Society novels, since they took place at the height of the Victorian spiritualism era and kind of twisted the powers in those novels within that world, if so, then I think you will also be interested in the London Seance Society by Sarah Penner, particularly because it centers around a mystery at the center while also weaving in some strong sexual tension and this exploration of power and contrasting that against reality and kind of skepticism. Now, in the Arcane Society novels, we don't question the existence of the powers, and those powers exist within the larger kind of fad of spiritualism, and spiritualism acts as a kind of cover for a lot of those powers and work in in tandem. In the London Seance Society, we are definitely exploring the tension between skepticism and belief, and this is played out both in the mystery and in our characters, because the plot follows Lena, a natural scientist who has sought out a renowned spiritualist, Vaudeline, who her sister Evie had studied under. But since then, Evie has turned up dead and Lena has gone seeking answers, even though Evie was the believer of the two of them. And so Lena is becoming an apprentice of sorts for Vaudeline outside of the normal kind of course of study for her taking on apprentices. And Lena's goal is to seek answers about her sister's death and get Vaudeline to help with a seance, especially because all kind of evidence points to foul play involved in Evie's essentially murder. However, when we open the book and Lena is assisting Vaudelin in her first seance, which I find interesting because I saw a video of Penner kind of introducing the plot of this book, and she introduces it where I kind of started with this idea of Lena seeking out Vaudelin. But that's not where the action of the book and the narrative starts, which I find super interesting and definitely want to swing back to. However, at this seance where Lena isn't still quite sure what she believes. This is her first kind of coming against, kind of testing her skepticism in this realm. And Vaudelin is renowned in her spiritualism and in her seance practice for helping grieving families seek answers, especially when there is foul play involved. So that is what they are in the course of doing. And they are just kind of ramping up into this seance when there is a knock on the door. And this immediately kind of breaks the spell and opens up this question of was this intentional? But this messenger that enters is bringing Vaudelin a message and basically she learns that the head of the London Seance Society back in London, obviously, has been murdered and she was close with this man. And she actually had fled London, which we didn't know a whole lot about at first, but come to find out is due to her kind of hearing rumblings about potential fraud within the London Seance Society. And she approaches this man about it, but while he is seeking out the corruption in his organization, he tells her it's safer for her to leave the city, that he doesn't want to risk her safety in getting caught up in all of this, especially as she's higher profile. And there have been rumblings that she's kind of following these rumors and investigating. So she has come to France and this news follows her because the head of the seance division of the London Seance Society, which isn't called the seance division to be fair, but he's reached out to Vaudelin to have a seance to help solve this murder. And Lena decides to go back with her because one of her goals has been to get Vaudelin to host or have a seance for her sister Evie. So she sees this as a way to get Vaudelin back in the city. So there's this agreement that after Vaudelin solves this murder at the London Seance Society, she will hold a seance for Evie and get to the bottom of that murder. However, it quickly becomes evident that there might be a lot more going on and they're not just solving a crime, but kind of untangling one as well. And they may be caught up in the actuality of this crime a little bit more than is comfortable. So this follows both Lena and Mr. Morley, the head of the department of spiritualism in point of view. However, Lena's point of view is told through third person and Mr. Morley's is told through first person, which is really interesting, especially because Morley's first person has a lot of flashbacks, especially as it becomes evident. And here I just want to kind of warn, I'm going to try and stay away from big spoilers. However, when talking about mysteries, there's always a kind of risk of indicating some spoilers. And to be completely blunt and honest, I don't know that the twists in this mystery are really twisty enough to completely avoid spoilers for astute people, so you may come to some conclusions.
hands on your own accidentally. But it becomes clear in the narrative that Mr. Morley is connected to Lena's sister Evie and there was something more going on there. And as the head of the Department of Spiritualism, not the Department of Seances. He is in charge of the seances. And this also connects him to some childhood friends of Lena and Evie, including Lena's childhood crush and best friend who had passed away tragically with her father years ago. And there had been a kind of attempted seance with the London Seance Society that didn't pay off. And then there was a separate seance for her crush's first love's father that only the mother the widow was invited to. And then this widow ended up remarrying one of the leaders of the London Seance Society. So I found it really interesting, these differing points of view, because Lena is definitely our skeptic in the narrative. And this idea of the third person or the fact that her story or her side of the story is being told through third person lends some kind of credence to it. It makes it feel like it is the truth in some way. And by Morley telling us his story in first person, it makes us interact with that story in a different way. Because through the first person, he can kind of tell us things at his own pace, especially because he's the one holding a lot of the cards in terms of knowing what was going on inside the London Seance Society. Because Lena and Vaudelin are both outsiders. And so he has the knowledge of what led up to this man's murder. He discovered the body, which I mean, makes us, it made me as a reader go, well, that's suspicious. But how suspicious is up to Morley's narrative. Now, even amidst these differing points of view, which I again found very interesting in terms of the type of storytelling. And I also found it interesting, like I said, that we kind of jumped into this seance right away. We were starting at the height of the action. So I found that maneuvering interesting because it really set the tone for the novel that we were really going to be focusing on this mystery. It was a very fast-paced novel. It was a very easy read. It was kind of a palate cleanser in a lot of ways because the prose, whether first or third person, didn't feel particularly deep to me. And the structure kind of made it clear that it wanted us to focus on this action because it didn't give us the buildup between Lena and Vaudelin in particular, which was kind of interesting because it was just kind of throwing us in in the middle, which I find fascinating from a storytelling standpoint. I think it's a really smart, interesting choice. However, in this narrative, in some ways, it left us kind of scrambling to catch up. Now, to be fair, Lena and Vaudelin's relationship and their dynamic, I think is the strongest part of this book because the sexual tension between them is just so delicious. And honestly, I think that's the best kind of maintained tension in the book because the mystery itself, it doesn't feel like it has a whole lot of tension to it. The stakes feel inherent to Lena and Vaudelin's relationship more than to the mystery itself. And the characters themselves are kind of sacrifice to the action in a lot of ways too. Vaudelin is the hardest to kind of pin down, especially because I think as readers, I think the narrative wants us to keep our opinions open or it wants us to question our perception of her at different points. We hear about her reputation, but we don't really see it. The style of this is pretty blunt and can lead to tell rather than show, even when we start in the midst of the action, in the midst of a seance, which should be primed to really set the scene perfectly for us. It still feels kind of disconnected from that reality in a lot of ways. The atmosphere feels kind of vague and surface level, especially when the book really wants to interrogate that tension, like I've said before, between skepticism and belief. And this first kind of seance is setting out this potential for skepticism for Lena. This idea of did it go right? However, we kind of start, we get the amp up of the seance, we get the interruption, and then we cut to after and hearing about how it didn't maybe go exactly how Lena was expecting it. So we didn't get to experience that as readers. We were just told about it later in the same way that we're told about Vaudelin's renown. And we hear about all of the ways that her seances can kind of spin out of control. We hear about all of the ways that other seances can spin out of control. We hear about the way fraudsters are playing on this spiritualist craze in flashbacks between Lena and Evie, but we don't really see any of that. We don't really get the atmosphere of these moments. So the research is evident in the 
telling in the reporting of a lot of this. It's clear that Penner knows the world of spiritualism in this time, but we don't really get to see it play out in a way that lets us as readers also kind of play with that interrogation of skepticism and belief. And in some ways I think that it's holding out for the final seance because that makes some very clear choices. It makes it very clear to us as readers whether this narrative is choosing skepticism or belief. But up until then the tension in that choice isn't really there. And the tension in a lot of things other than Lena and Bodlin's relationship isn't really there. In terms of the world building in that relationship, I think it would have been really interesting because the narrative is clearly interested in exploring the power that women had within the spiritualist movement. We have Vaudelin as this renowned spiritualist and is juxtaposing this against a group of men who have formed a gentleman's club kind of exploiting this craze, this phenomenon for profit. And I say exploit because in Morley's point of view, it talks about how the head of the society is putting pressure on him to kind of figure out these fraud claims because it's costing them money. Meanwhile, we see Vaudelin working with grieving parents. However, we also hear these rumors again of the way that her seances can kind of spin out of control, even if we feel kind of removed and pulled back from the danger of that. However, that danger is really interesting because it also explores this kind of sexual liberation in this really buttoned up Victorian era. These seances were a craze, but as the narrative directly explores, there was a seduction to them as well, and there was a lowering of inhibitions and cultural mores within these rooms. And I think that if we'd gotten to play in that world a little bit more specifically, if we'd drawn that out a little bit more specifically outside of the action, building the atmosphere around a little bit more outside of the telling of that atmosphere, it would have only heightened the tension and the sexual tension between Vaudelin and Lena, which was already great. And like I said, I think the most successful part of the book for me personally. However, I think that it would have offered an extra layer and an extra thematic exploration to that relationship and an extra thematic layer in terms of them claiming their power. Because those themes are here, it's clear that that is what the book wants to explore. But because the plotting feels so blunt and lacks a little bit of nuance, it kind of takes away some of the nuance from those thematic explorations as well. And when I say blunt, we have this mystery unfolding. I am not a novice to mysteries by any means, but I'm also not an expert. And the mystery here didn't have any real surprises for me, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I think if we'd had more atmosphere or elevated thematic exploration, it would have masked a little bit more of that. And when I say blunt in terms of the mystery and the plotting, it felt really easy. Everything just kind of unfolded. They kind of went from spot to spot, and people would give them information and it kind of just unraveled naturally. And even where there were kind of intended red herrings, they weren't really red herrings. And because we were kind of moving from point A to point B, it was supposed to feel like these women were investigating, but it didn't at the same time. And so once the mystery kind of laid itself bare, all of the twists, the hands had been played, there were no more cards. That is where it got really, really interesting, I think, because then we were really facing things head on. And that is where the atmosphere really started to appear and to build itself out. I think in some ways some of that holding back of atmosphere was keeping things close to the chest to try and not to reveal a hand. However, if I wasn't being told by the narrative that this was the Victorian era, it didn't feel like the Victorian era to the point where there were even a couple of times, at least two that I counted for sure, where Lena referenced her tummy or a feeling in her tummy. And it just completely threw me out of the narrative, both in terms of like the Victorian setting whether that may have been a saying at the time or not, I'm not commenting on, but it was definitely one of those things that feels too modern. Additionally, it felt very childish. It just really threw me out of it. So I think that the thematic explorations here made sense. We had really this idea of skepticism versus belief. We had this kind of undercurrent of trickery versus truth. We had this real exploration of women and men within this world, this realm of spiritualism, this space that we kind of associate in a lot of ways with women and especially 
space that allowed women to kind of claim a sort of power that they may not have had in society at large, but then we're juxtaposing it against a group of men who have taken that power and twisted it for themselves in some way. Now, were all of these explorations super subtle? No. We have Lena, who's a natural scientist, which I think may have been more interesting to me if it had gone into it more, if it had felt a little more subtle other than her holding up a fossil at one point and being like, this is tangible, this is science. It didn't really explore that conflict within her and this idea of belief versus skepticism for her very personally. It flirted with the idea, it wanted to explore it, but it failed in some ways because we were so focused on getting from point A to point B. And there were little moments that it sprinkled throughout to be revelations at the end for her that kind of played into this tension that I would have liked to see further explored. Additionally, there's at least one character where it's seeming to try and explore some symbolism about themselves or their character through some physical manifestation or physical appearance. And I struggle with this because I don't like this implication that people's moral characters can be outwardly seen or that outward appearance is a reflection of moral character. We see plenty of gorgeous people nowadays scamming and in fact that helps them do it. And I thought this was going to complicate this a little bit because it did explore an insecurity related to this physicality. And then we kind of explore this idea of self-esteem and some other explorations that I want to articulate but will definitely spoil something if I do so I'm gonna hold off on. Then there were again at least two references in the prose itself that referenced a blemish in a way that implied some kind of negative connotation. And I just didn't think that the narrative was nuanced enough to really interrogate that idea without it sounding like a judgment. I personally feel like, again, all of the nuance of this book lives in Vaudelin and Lena's relationship and the charge of that, which I think is spectacular and almost wish we would have explored even more. Those moments built a tension that I would have loved to see sustained throughout the rest of the novel. I would have loved to see that tension built and played with a little bit more, even within the terms of the investigation. I think there was an effort to do this, absolutely, but I think it fell by the wayside in some of this more exposition heavy kind of revelations of the investigation itself. And again, some of that was the maneuvering of the plot, so the twists didn't show their hand too early. However, the twists I personally felt like were somewhat predictable, so I would have rather built out and explored some of the thematic explorations and the atmosphere a little bit more. However, I also understand that this book is supposed to be a lot more fast-paced and isn't supposed to be a dense historical fiction, which is kind of why I paralleled it to the Arcane Society at the beginning. Because I still had a good time. Were the beats expected? Kind of. But there was also some satisfaction in hitting those beats and them kind of coming to fruition in the way that I was expecting. There was some narrative comfort there. And then I could focus on what was important. Lena and Vaudelin's relationship. So I think what I ultimately found most interesting about this book was its structure and its points of view, because while it is a pretty standard accessible work, it's not straightforward in its storytelling. There are flashbacks, we see multiple points of view, so it is still experimenting with form, even within the bounds it exists within. I just wish the bounds had been pushed just a little bit, just a little. That being said, I have not read The Lost Apothecary, which is Pinner's first work, which really exploded her onto the scene. So I'm not sure how it exists in conversation, even within her own body of work. So I am automatically putting it in conversation with other books I've read, which mostly happen to be Victorian romantic thrillers, which I think this kind of is. I think there were some definite feminist explorations as well. Again, we could have pushed it a little bit more, but if you've read this work, Pinner's other work, other Victorian romantic thrillers. Let me know what you're thinking. Thanks as always for hanging out and listening to my thoughts. Read something good, like and subscribe if you feel like it. We flipped those today, but yeah, bye.